Welcome back to Fullerton College Printing Technology Print 101. This is Professor Ben Kewitt, and this is part two of our video on chapter two from our textbook, Safety. One, mo one key piece I forgot to mention in the last video before we moved on from compressed air is 30 PSI, pounds per square inch, is the maximum pressure you should be using for acceptable uses of compressed air. You should not need more than that. Now let's move on to personal safety and chemical hazards. There are all sorts of chemicals that we use in printing, although these things are being replaced often with less volatile chemicals as time goes on and we are able to do these things. Uh, more environmentally friendly inks are being used, less crazy chemicals are being used, things that don't quite get you as messed up as you used to. But still, we need to use personal perfect protection devices. Things like respirators are a good idea depending on the chemicals you're using because some have inhalation hazards. Things as simple as uh, what do you call them? Safety glasses or safety goggles are a good idea as well because they protect you against chemical splashes. We do work with acids, among other things, and a lot of solvents, and many of those things are bad for your eyes. So just a quick splash protection is a good thing to have. Some things have a bit more of a splatter potential, and it's a good idea to wear a full face shield. We have one in our printing lab that we use actually for our paper press, or sorry, drill press, which punches holes because that one has a high speed spinning part and it could throw fragments of things around and you want your whole face protected from impact. Uh, these things are also good ideas to wear around nowadays, thanks to the worldwide pandemic we're living through. So, hey, what's good for chemicals is good for diseases, sort of, not all the way. Don't quote me on that, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on WebMD. I'm kidding. I realize it's a recorded video for posterity. There, I can't make those jokes online. Whoops. Um, anyways, um, I'm not a doctor. I'm a printer and a teacher. So uh, I try to keep up on things. Uh, you should refer to the WHO and the CDC for questions about disease protection because that is not my area of specialty. So those are some things. You can also have full body suits that can protect you as well. Again, apologies, this was a funnier picture back when this was something you would see in video games about aliens and not so much things that would be potentially a part of our everyday world now. But anyways, there are suits like this you can wear for depending on how bad a chemical you're working with, how hazardous a material are you dealing with. So types of chemicals that we deal with and types of problems that we'll run into. There are chemicals such as organic solvents. We do a lot of solvents because solvents clean up ink. You have to do something to get rid of the ink. The most common one that I've seen out there is rubbing alcohol. That's not dangerous, you say, but yes, it is. In small quantities, it's great to put on a, uh, what do you call them? Sorry, I'm getting the British phrase, cotton wool, uh, cotton ball on them and use them to wipe off, you know, scrapes and bruises to disinfect yourself. But it's a disinfectant because it kills things. Enough of it will kill you. You're not supposed to breathe the fumes. It is a fire hazard. So even that is not the greatest thing, although it's much better than some solvents out there. There's also plate making chemicals. There's a girl making a plate in the top right picture here. Chemicals used to develop them are similar to photochemicals and they're not the best things to have on you and they're not the best things to have in you. Plus, as my dean and I were talking about the other day, it depends on where things are. A cup of solvent, if you spill it on your hands, might give you a light burn and might be a discomfort for a while. You need to wash your hands real quick to fix it. But that same cup of solvent, if ingested inside you or breathed into a lung, is much more damaging and much more permanent. So keeping things where they are and keeping them out of our bodies is a huge thing for us. Anyways, plate making chemicals. Also gases, fumes, and dusts. That's what the guy at the volcano there is in front of. Sulfuric fumes, that was a fun picture. Um, by the way, uh, if I ever turn super villain, I'm not going to have a volcano lair. I'm a little terrified uh, of those things in particular. Hold over from childhood, right? Anyways, here he is in a sulfur fume gas spout next to a volcano. Uh, so gases, fumes, and dust are a problem. And on the left is my best picture I could find for an ink mist. An ink mist is when you have a press that's huge with a lot of ink on it running so fast and spinning so hard that the uh, centripetal force of the rotating uh, ink rollers can throw ink off and not throw it off just in globs, but it can actually spray a fine mist as if someone was spraying a spray can of spray paint into the air of ink. And as you know from spray paint and spray cans, you wanna use those in well-ventilated areas and not breathe it. So ink mists are actually a danger. You don't wanna breathe that. Uh, any sort of chemical into your lungs is generally not a good idea. 
VOCs, volatile organic compounds or volatile organic solvents is what the chapter talks about in the book. These are some very common things. And I know organic is a buzzword in food these days and organic means safer and better for you. Organic means no pesticide. It means that you're gonna get your wheat without them spraying weed killer on it to harvest it, right? That's great. But we're not talking about that kind of organic here. In this case, organic, if you're talking in the science and chemistry terms, an organic chemical is merely a chemical that uses a carbon-based molecule at its center. So anything carbon-based is organic. Keep that in mind. That does not mean that it's safe and healthy. Volatile organic compounds means they are very dangerous organic compounds. These are, unfortunately, the best solvents. The best way to clean something is with a very dangerous chemical. Kind of like the best way to clean white clothes is to put bleach on them. And if you put bleach on your skin, you get burned. And if you get, you breathe the fumes of bleach, I mean, they use that as a chemical weapon in war. Anyways, so volatile organic compounds are great for cleaning, but they're not great for us humans. Uh, we're trying to use less of them. They're toxic, they help, they work really well and they evaporate very fast. In fact, paint used to have a lot more of them. One of the issues with old paint wasn't just the lead content. Old paints and old inks would have VOCs in them because that would let them be fast drying. In fact, old screen printing ink was literally made out of poison, but we'll get there when we reach that chapter. So there are a couple things you should not use. <laughs> Benzene, carbon tetrachloride, gasoline, chloroform, and carbon disulfide are specifically named in the books as things you should never ever use. <laughs> uh, they are extremely bad. Many of those are literally poisons used in warfare as such. Although Geneva says not to, some people still do. Um, anyways, so there are a lot of these things. You want to li limit your exposure. Make sure you're wearing breathing um, respirators and uh, uh, filters when possible. You should always use a well-ventilated area. If you can use these outside, it's better than using them inside, although they're also not great for the environment. Something to look out for too if you're painting your house or if any of you are having kids and painting a nursery. Watch out. A lot of house paint has volatile organic compounds in it to help it flow well and dry quickly. All right, which leads me to the MSDS, the Material Data Safety Sheet. Hey guys, we've reached one of our, well actually it's not our first, darn, I forgot to celebrate our first acronym with you. Darn, darn, darn. Yay, second acronym. I guess I saw some confetti left in the launcher. Uh, but anyways, the Material Data Safety Sheet is an important thing. There are online versions and there are physical binders of literal safety sheets that are required by law to be kept at any place of work or any place of use of chemicals. Every chemical a place uses must be recorded and the data safety sheet must be kept on hand for like 30 years after you stop using it. That way people can come back if they develop some disease years down the road and say, hey, I think I was exposed to this back at my job when I was 18. Yeah, they're, they're required to maintain these records. Anyways, the MSDS tells you all sorts of things like what is it? What can it do? What should you look out for? What, what are the problems of it? What are, how do you protect yourself against it? What are the fire and reactivity dangers? There's a lot of things to look at with this. And the MSDS is a way of knowing what it is you're up against. Rag storage. We do this in our classroom whenever we're in. Rags used to clean things are soaked in oily ink and solvents. This lets me use one of my favorite phrases from growing up because there was, it was a thing that was always on like 2020, the news show as this mysterious problem where people would burst into flames for no reason. Spontaneous combustion. I don't know if humans spontaneously combust. It seems like an interesting hoax, but rags do. Oily rags do the oxidation process when oil um, combines with oxygen because it does not evaporate the way water does. Oil never evaporates, oil stays wet. In fact, you know a lot of Renaissance paintings that you see in art museums from I don't know, 600 years ago, around the time of Johannes Gutenberg, you guys should know who he is by now, paintings of his contemporaries and people just after him, the big ones, um, the Rembrandts, the Michelangelos, the Leonardo da Vinci paintings, they're still wet. You heard that right, it's been 600 years. The top layers might crack a little because it oxidizes slowly and kind of cures and dries out. But the under layers, they make layers and layers of oily paint, never 
Well, I don't know about never. Haven't dried yet in 600 years. Your rags don't dry either. It's possible, and this is one of those things that used to be a thing, where if you'd have oily rags stored in a box somewhere in your basement, I guess that's not California, is it? I mean, what's a basement, right? But anyways, you have it stored in your garage and the rags will just burst into flames because the oxidation process can generate heat. And technically speaking, burning is combining with oxygen too, isn't it? That's what fire is. It's a oxidizing reaction that happens quickly. And if you get enough of them together and they speed up and combine with enough air, you can have a fire without a match, without electricity, just oil on rags in enough quantity can start a fire. Anyways, that's why you put them in a sealed metal container. The sealed container keeps them from getting too much air in them so they can't oxidize. And the metal container means that even if they do burst into a small fire, it'll be contained in the little metal can and not spread to everything else in the print shop. Because fire is a real hazard in printing. We have chemicals, we have oils, we have paper and we have high voltage electricity all in the same room. Everything you wanted, right? Anyways, you combine any, any combination of these things and you have a real fire hazard. Even paper dust is a real fire hazard because paper dust, any sort of dust can burst into flames. There's a great Mythbusters that maybe I'll link to in our sheet, in our uh, canvas page so you can see this, where they make a cannon fireball using non-dairy powdered coffee creamer. Don't try this at home, kids. Any particulate that has the right mixture of particle and oxygen is a bomb waiting to go off. In farm country, uh, grain silos have problems of exploding into flames for no reason. Again, if you get the right mixture of oxygen and particulate, you can have a fire. So paper dust is a bigger hazard than you think it is. And most of the stuff we have in our lab burns pretty well. Um, that's not a recommendation other than please be safe. I like my lab. When we get to go in, we have to be extra careful for fire, which means when you pick up dust, always vacuum it, never blow it with an air hose. We already talked about that with compressed air. You don't blow it, you suck it. No guffawing, no guffawing, but you need to use a vacuum to suck up dust. You don't want dust that can go airborne. Airborne dust is an inhalation danger and a, honestly, a explosive fire danger. So we watch out for that. If there are any leaking solvent containers, we have to watch out for those too. And solvent and oil spills need to be wiped up and cleaned up immediately because they all increase the risk of fire. Noise, noise is a problem. I'm sure you've heard of noise pollution. It's a thing. People living in cities don't get as good a rest as people living out in the countryside and John Mearing it and living up a pine tree for a week to see what it's like to be a pine tree. Um, living around noise is stressful. It's bad for zoo animals. It panics them, they can't escape from it. Remember that of all your senses, we're most susceptible to noise. Uh, also touching and uh, that sort of thing as well, like physical touch, we can always feel, but you can't turn it off. You can shut your eyes and not look at something. You can plug your nose and not smell something. It's easy not to taste something. Don't put it in your mouth, right? How do you not hear it? You hear every noise. Every noise reaches you. You're asleep, your ears are still turned on. You can't shut them off. Too much noise damages them. I can tell you from personal experience that I violated some of this when I was younger and I regret it now. Um, some of it was not printing related, some of it was. I've already established, I think, that I'm a bit of a nerd, right? Uh, time to find out just how much. In high school, I went to every football game because I was in the band. And I played trombone, which by the way, is the only instrument you could poke people with. So it makes it so cool. You put that slide out and tap, tap, tap. But anyways, um, you know where we stood? That's right, directly in front of the drum line. The drum line all wore hearing protection while they beat their drums as loud as they can. And marching drums are much louder than concert drums. So I've already starting to lose some hearing as of high school and being in a marching band. And that's a long time ago now. Uh, we had to contend with dinosaurs and woolly mammoths while marching around our field. Anyways, I'm old and I'm a nerd. Ha ha, right? That's great. So um, noise greater than 90 decibels, you should not be exposed to for very long. There's a great chart in your book on page 54 <clears throat> telling you how loud things are. Um, I should also mention that one of my print jobs, I worked with a machine that had an air compressor built into it because it had an air suction system uh, to feed the paper. And that compressor was really loud. And it was like having a train running through the room behind you. And I still feel like my hearing is a bit permanently damaged from sitting next to it. Anyways, I'm running out of time for this video because YouTube limits me to 15 minutes per video and uh, your butt sitting on a chair also limits us to not wanting to go too long per video. Be back with a short one to finish us off.
Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.